for today's show, we are going to be talking about the, first off, the Detroit Lions and the San Francisco 49ers game in the NFC and the comeback that took place in that one. Then we are going to be moving on to the AFC matchup between the Chiefs and the Ravens. And I have a lot of thoughts about that game. So we'll maybe spill a little bit over into the third segment there and then get into the Lamar Jackson conversation, talking about what we can expect from him as NFL fans going forward. How do we evaluate him going forward? And then finally, to finish off the show, I want to do this in the least cynical way possible, but knowing that we are going to be talking about the 49ers and the Chiefs a lot for the next two weeks, I do just want to sort of wrap up both the Lions and the Ravens, and truthfully, this was a very emotional championship weekend for these two teams that lost. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about the conversation which loss is worst, and how do these two teams move on from here. Before we get into everything, please remember to like and follow. And then for any of our live viewers, remember to use the link at the bottom ticker scrolling across your screen. That is streamelements.com slash slash tip to help get your questions the priority that they deserve. So, getting into this first matchup between the 49ers and the Lions, this was a little bit of a shocker to me coming out of the gates just based off of how these two teams looked. Now, I think that the Lions are a very talented team, and especially their offense, you can see that, but I did not see them running away with the first half like they did in this one. The They actually led by 17 points at the halftime, and they, and they took that 24-7 lead after kicking a field goal right at the end of the first half, which was honestly a little bit of a surprising decision from Dan Campbell to kick that. Not that I thought it was the wrong decision by any means, but just based off of, and these are my thoughts at the time, based off of his track record, you would think that he'd maybe be a little bit more aggressive and go for the points. At that time, I was thinking, just end the half, get the points. It's not even like the other team gets this bad field position if you don't convert because you're just going into halftime as it is. So take the points and move on. That's what they did in this circumstance. And then field goals ended up, of course, being a huge storyline going forward in this game because of none other than Madman Dan Campbell and his very aggressive fourth down strategies that he's really put on display for the entirety of his career as the head coach for the Detroit Lions, joined in 2021 and set the record for the most fourth down attempts in the league in I think of the single season record, if I'm not mistaken. And at that time too, the Lions obviously much lower expectations. They were going into a rebuild. So it's a little bit more understandable there. And Dan Campbell trying to build up the culture in that sense. But now a few years later, they found themselves in the NFC Championship game. The first time the Lions had been there since 1991. And it's not quite equivalent situations you could say just based off of the stakes behind making decisions such as going for it on fourth down they went for it on fourth down in the second half twice while either leading or down by three points the first time they did so they had a chance to extend the lead back to a 17 point game a three score game early in the second half when they were on the 49ers 28 yard line, they elect to go for it. And it is an incomplete pass, one that Josh Reynolds very easily could have caught. Not maybe the perfectly placed ball. Nick Bosa came flying off of the left end to almost sack Jared Goff, but Goff escapes that, makes a good enough throw that again, probably should have been caught. But 
that falls incomplete, and then it keeps it a two-score game instead of a three-score game, allows the 49ers to build up some semblance of momentum after really seeming dead for a lot of that game. And I think that sort of if you go back and if you were just to listen to that game as a whole, from really that point on, and it was almost immediately after the 49ers got a huge chunk play off of what should have maybe been an interception from Detroit, a misthrown Brock Purdy deep ball, hits their defensive back Kendall Vildor in the face mask, bounces up, and Ayuk is able to bring that pass down. From that sequence of events on, the San Francisco crowd just was juiced. And that really wasn't the case for a lot of the game. It was very quiet. The broadcast was showing the shot of a sad Brock Purdy. It's like, wow, this is actually how their season's going to end. And at that point, it was more about the Lions, but there was a little bit of Shanahan sort of takes I think that were brewing of their offense coming up short in a playoff game once again but again credit them for the comeback but before we move on to the 49ers as a whole here the second fourth down decision came later in the game where at that point now in the fourth quarter they are trailing by three points after things just totally unraveled for the Detroit Lions they Go for it again in field goal range. It would have been a 40-something yard field goal. And the 49ers bring pressure again, force Jared Goff out of the pocket. And that was sort of the conversation coming into this game. If you can move Jared Goff off of his spot, he's a very talented quarterback nonetheless, but you can force some inaccuracy issues. And that's pretty much what took place. He was looking downfield for St. Brown, and they just couldn't connect. So... Now, after the game, Campbell said, I understand the scrutiny I'll get. That's a part of the gig. He said that he did not regret his decisions. And you know what? You do have to, although you can disagree with his philosophy like I pretty much do, but there is something to sticking with your guns. I think that it's not a totally fair comparison, but Brandon Staley also had very interesting fourth down philosophies and it sort of seemed like he was wishy-washy over the course of his career and that uncertainty led to uncertainty within the locker room and you know Dan Campbell said he was going to die with his players he expects them to make those plays and at least on that first one they had a chance again I probably would have kicked it on both occasions but there is a little bit of something to this going for it all strategy had gotten them to the NFC championship game. They came out in the opening game of the season and ran a fake punt against the defending champion Kansas city chiefs for the first NFL game of the season. They let them know that that was what the expectation was going forward is you're not going to be able to, count them out really on any singular play and ultimately it comes back to hurt them but I think that it goes a lot further than just Dan Campbell I thought that it was interesting after the game where in the press conference what he said to everybody was that he told his players right after the game this may have been our only shot and I think that they are positioned well going forward but it is true just how tough the NFL can be to continuously get back to that point. You wouldn't necessarily know it from this Super Bowl matchup between the Chiefs on the other side and the 49ers in this one as Niners gang is commenting, going back to Vegas. And I do think that as he points out saying, sorry, Patrick, no Jimmy G this time, I think that Brock Purdy is much more well-suited for this moment. You saw how he played down the stretch of the season, or the stretch of the comeback, I should say, and I thought that he was exceptional. The Niners looked bad. They looked very discombobulated to start that game. They miss a 48-yard field goal on their opening possession of the game. 
Purdy threw an interception where he was getting hit in the pocket. His arm was popped, so it wasn't a good pass, but at least it's better than some of the mental mistakes you could possibly worry about Purdy. And I think that he's very strong mentally. He doesn't often put it in harm's way, but I did not think he was at his sharpest against the Packers last week. And yes, this play comes up as an interception, but I don't think that it's necessarily something to worry about all that much. The Detroit Lions, they had the most pressures in the NFL this season. This was a blitz-heavy team. They were trying to get Purdy off of his spot. They get to him on this play, but you saw down the stretch of the game just how well he was able to not just make the throws, but he I had never seen that level of mobility with Brock Purdy before, and this is just something that I feel like I watch a lot of football. I didn't know this is something that he necessarily had in his bag, the way that he was evading pressure, ducking out of sacks, and then getting up the field for scrambles. He had the scramble at the end of the Green Bay game last week, where on that final drive, he had a scramble to put them closer to scoring distance, but I did not see this one coming. This game is a huge surprise to me. I thought that throughout the game too, Purdy did a pretty good job of throwing under pressure. I know that I referenced that one interception that he did have, but I thought as a whole, yes, he was being hit on that one individual play, but I thought that, you know, the Lions were trying to throw a lot of stuff at him. He had an incredible throw, I thought, earlier in the game where he got lit up by Lions defensive tackle Liam McNeil, and he was still able to deliver a great strike down the field to Debo Samuel over the middle. And I do think that if your criticism is going to be that the biggest offensive play really for the 49ers in this game was came off of a not great party throw, I wouldn't disagree with you if that's how it played out. Like we were talking about that Brandon Ayuk 51-yard reception that came immediately after the Lions field goal, or the Lions decision to actually not kick a field goal. I think that it was interesting because Purdy overthrew Ayuk and he had the time. It just wasn't a great throw. Now, interesting, and I think it gets a little bit forgotten, but the refs did initially throw a flag on that play. I thought that as I was watching it, immediately I thought it was pass interference. They end up picking up the flag because Ayuk caught it anyways. I think that if he doesn't, and that's an interception, there's a good chance that they do actually call that penalty as it is. So I don't actually, you know, fault Purdy as much as some other people. If you are a Purdy doubter, I think that you can try and use that to your argument, but I don't think that it really plays because I think that one way or another, that play likely does come out in a positive gain for the 49ers. So they get themselves together. This is, you know, obviously going into these past two weeks, the mantra behind the 49ers is that they're a team that can't come back from down. They can't throw their way back into a game. They have to play their own game. Now, the Lions did give them the opportunity to sort of settle into their own. There was, they scored the touchdown following that Brandon Ayuk reception. McCaffrey ends up punching it in. And then on the first play of the next Detroit drive, Jameer Gibbs runs the wrong way in terms of the handoff, never has control. He fumbles. The Niners tie the game right after that. So, I mean, you can definitely... Dan Campbell deserves a lot of blame, as the majority of head coaches do when you lose a big game like this and the lead falls apart the way that it does. But I think that it it's it can't just be on him. It can't 100% come down to those two plays. Maybe don't fumble on your own 25-yard line. Josh Reynolds, two big drops, and I think that their receivers as a whole weren't 
really great down the stretch of that game. And then, obviously, the total blunder at the very end of the game when they are trying to score, the decision to then run the ball and burn a timeout after not getting in the end zone, getting tackled behind the line of scrimmage, that was pretty much a death sentence for them because they were then going to need an onside kick, which in today's NFL is borderline impossible. So there's a lot of questionable coaching decisions. But, I mean, credit to the Niners. They are a very talented team on both sides. I know that the Lions sort of took it to them in the first half, but the that's what the Lions do to people a lot of the times on offense. They have one of the best offensive lines. I love watching Penne Sewell play football. I used to be a lineman when I played football in high school, so maybe I'm a little too attached to it. But when that dude is moving in space, please keep your eyes on him because he lays out some of the filthiest blocks in the NFL. I think it's a ton of fun to watch. So ultimately, it is the 49ers moving on to the Super Bowl to play the Kansas City Chiefs, the matchup from 2019. So before we sort of get into some of the bigger picture stuff with that, we are going to take a quick break. And on the other side, we will be recapping the 49ers, or the Ravens and Chiefs game. So stick with us. <laughs> 